today. Uh, so I'll be telling you about the interplay of RNA structure and RNA protein interactions. And so I will uh, start by telling you about RNA structure. Uh, so RNA is, of course, one of the uh, fundamental molecules in every living system. Uh, it is a heteropolymer of three nucleotides, A, a U, G, and C. Uh, and uh, it has three levels of structure. The primary structure is simply the particular sequence, uh, such as the one that you have uh, found up here. So it's just a fancy name for sequence. Uh, but now these nucleotides, G, C, A, and U, uh, they like to form base pairs. G's pairs with C and A with U. Uh, and just like the nucleotides of the DNA, uh, they like to form these base pairs. In the DNA, we always have two molecules that are exactly complementary. If one has a G, the other has a C. If one has an A, the other has a T. And that makes this beautiful double helical structure of the DNA. In RNA, we don't have the other molecule. Uh, so the Gs in this molecule are looking for Cs in that very same molecule uh, to form base pairs with. Uh, and that is what then forms the secondary structure. So the secondary structure is just the information who pairs with whom. And so, for example, this very first G pairs with this C, and this is what you see up here, uh, and then it goes on. Uh, now, these uh, regions of consecutive base pairs, uh, they look basically like DNA. They are sort of double helical. They're connected by these flexible regions. Uh, and then this whole thing falls up uh, into this tertiary kind of structure, which is the three-dimensional structure of the RNA. Now, while for this particular RNA, its tertiary structure is very important, for many of the RNAs in the cell, tertiary structure is actually not that relevant. They still will have secondary structure because whenever you have bases, they will base pair. And so the entire talk will be focusing only on this secondary structure. Now, secondary structure prediction is the process uh, where given a sequence, you want to know what's the secondary structure, i.e. who pairs with whom. And this is a mat very mature field. It started in the late 70s, uh, and it has been really uh, evolving a lot since then. Uh, so basically, there are a lot of software packages, some of which are mentioned here, that can exactly do this. Given a sequence, they will give you a structure. But what they do is they calculate the structure that you would find in a test tube if the RNA is all by itself. However, in a real cell, the RNA actually interacts with lots of proteins. And these protein RNA interactions are important because they regulate the RNA function. Which protein binds in RNA will determine how stable the RNA is, uh, where in the cell it's going to go to, if it will ever be translated by a ribosome, and so on and so forth. So it's important to quantitatively understand these RNA protein interactions. Also, one thing to keep in mind uh, is that RNA protein interactions actually affect the structure. If you have a protein that binds the RNA and it only, for example, binds to single-stranded RNA, then that means that these nucleotides that are bound by the protein cannot at the same time uh, participate in base pairing and secondary structure. And vice versa, that means if some nucleotides are base paired, but the protein needs them to be single-stranded in order to uh, bind them, then uh, that will prevent the protein from binding. So we have structure affecting proteins and the proteins uh, affecting the structure. And the entire talk is about how do you actually uh, model that interplay between structure and protein. So uh, there is quite a bit uh, known experimentally um, in terms of RNA protein affinities, and we use this a lot. There are two high throughput techniques, RNA compete and RNA bind and seek. Uh, what they do is they make libraries of short and therefore unstructured RNA molecules. They pull the library down with a protein of interest. They sequence pre-pull down and post-pull down, and then just count how often you see each sequence, both in the pre and the po post-pull down. And the ratio of the two will then tell you how much the protein likes this particular uh, sequence. Uh, or in other words, it tells you what the binding constant is uh, for every sequence. But again, these are unstructured RNA molecules because they are short. Uh, and what we want to do is we want to then figure out how this knowledge of what the RNA is doing, uh, the protein is doing with the RNA for the short ones, uh, what does that mean for long and therefore structured RNA molecules? All right, so to, to give you a little bit of a flavor of what we are doing, I will become a little bit technical now. 
uh, for the next five minutes. Uh, so if it's too technical for you and you just want to turn off, don't walk completely away from your computer so I can wake you up in about five minutes when I get uh, into the consequences of all of this. Uh, but all this goes back to uh, McCaskill in 1990, uh, who basically said, well, let's do that Mac. Each secondary structure is a state. Uh, remember, secondary structure is the who pairs with whom. Uh, this is a discrete state space. It's a very big discrete state space. The uh, number of structures is about three to the n for a molecule of length n. The length of RNA is sort of in the hundreds to thousands. So three to the 1,000 is an insanely large number of structures, but still it's a finite number of structures, right? So you, we can think of the, the space of all these structures as a state space. Then to do stat mac, we need an energy for every state. Well, here is a very simple one, which says, let's just add up energies from all the base pairs. Uh, in the simplest case, this might just be counting. You know, you just count how many base pairs, how many of these dashed lines are in this structure. That's its energy. You can do a little better and say, okay, we know GC is a little more stable than AU and give them different energies depending on if they are GC or AU. Uh, but uh, sort of that's sort of what you can think about in terms of the energy. In practice, uh, we are actually using an energy model that is, has been established over several decades and has about 1,500 different parameters. Uh, but the idea is still the same for every structure, there's an energy. And of course, if you have states and if you have energies, then uh, StatMec tells you that uh, it, for anything thermodynamic, uh, you can derive it from the partition function, which is the sum over the Boltzmann factors. Now, this looks like a horrible sum, not because uh, this is a complicated thing, but because this is a set of three to the n uh, possible states. But the, what McCaskill uh, found out is that you can calculate this partition function in n to the third times. And n to the third for n equals a thousand, that's a billion. That's doable on the computer, right? And that's why this field has been so successful, uh, the field of RNA uh, secondary uh, structure prediction. Now, this is, of course, in the absence of proteins. So what do we now do uh, when we want to add proteins? Uh, well, let's start with the simplest case. Let's start with the case where we have only one protein binding the RNA and only in one spot. The rule that we will put on is that, uh, that, that the bases in the footprint cannot participate in any base pair. That's how the structure and the protein couple to each other. Uh, and then we need to know one number, which is how strongly the protein binds to that one spot. Uh, and that is quantified uh, by the dissociation constant. Uh, and then there is uh, work by Hakamala et al. Uh, that actually told us how to do this. Uh, what you need to do is you have to calculate the partition function for your RNA. That's what this double line means. Uh, you have to then calculate the partition function for the double line for the RNA where you do not allow any of the nucleotides in the protein footprint to participate. So you sum over all structures that do not have any of these bases paired. Both can be done in N to the third time with uh, current software. And then your partition function beca becomes the sum of this one and this one, where this one gets decorated with the concentration of the protein divided by this binding strength here expressed by the dissociation constant. Okay, so we have physicists, we have solved the, or somebody else has solved the one protein case for us. Of course, not every uh, RNA is only bound by one protein. There could be more than one protein binding site. Let's do two. Okay, so with two protein binding sites, we have four partition functions. Everything, the one without the first binding site, the one without the second binding site, and the one where both binding sites are excluded from forming base pairs. And then we add them all up with their corresponding concentration terms. Fine. So now we have four things that each take n to the third time to calculate, and we add them up. Now, of course, proteins, you don't actually know in how many places on an RNA they're going to bind. The binding sites could even overlap. So what you really need to calculate is this thing here, which is this term for nothing bound, takes you n to the third. This term here, which could bind a protein, a single protein at every position along the RNA. It has n things, each of which take you n to the third. Then all pairs of places, which now has n squared things, each of which takes you n to the third to calculate. This has, you get the idea, n to the third uh, uh, things that take n to the third to calculate, and so on and so forth. Uh, and our contribution is uh, that although this appears to be computationally very expensive, to show that you can do this whole thing still in n to the third time. Okay? 
Uh, so that is really uh, how we made it possible to describe RNA protein interactions on, and this interplay between RNA secondary structure and protein binding. Okay, so now what does it help you to be able to calculate this partition function? Of course, that Mac tells you anything can be calculated from the partition function, and especially useful quantity is the probability of protein binding. So that's the probability that a given RNA molecule is bound by at least one protein. It depends on the concentration. And as you always do it, instead, Mac, the numerator are all the states that you want. That's the states that contain protein. The denominator are all the states. You get the states that have a protein by subtracting the states without a protein away from the ones from all states. Uh, so if you can calculate Z of C, uh, you can calculate this ratio, and therefore the binding probability is a function of concentration. What that allows you to do is to calculate the concentration at which half of your RNAs are bound by protein. And why is this important? That's important because that's exactly how experimentalists determine the effective affinity of an RNA for a protein. They will titrate through the concentration of the protein, run gels for every concentration, pick out the concentration at which half of the RNAs are bound by protein, and that's what they call the effective dissociation constant. And so here we can calculate this effective dissociation constant and compare it to the experimentally measured ones. So here is this comparison. Uh, so this is for a particular protein where people have actually done experiments with multiple different RNA sequences, and they have measured the effective dissociation constant. The x-axis is this effective dissociation constant that has been measured. On the y-axis is the theoretically predicted uh, effective dissociation constant, uh, and the red line is x equals y. So if everything's perfect, then the predicted and the experimental should be exactly identical, and all the points should be on the red line. Well, there are two data sets here. The green one is what you get if you don't do what I just told you we can do, and you don't take into account RNA secondary structure. And what you see is even though there's a broad range of experimentally determined uh, dissociation constants, all the theoretically calculated ones fall into a fairly narrow window. So this is essentially a horizontal line. However, the blue points, that's what you get when you do what we are doing and take structure into account. And you can see that while we are not exactly on the diagonal, uh, we get a fairly good correlation uh, between the experimentally and the theoretical determined uh, dissociation constants. Uh, and in fact, we now have a web server that you can go to uh, and you can choose your protein and type in any sequence that you want and it will calculate for you uh, the expected uh, effective dissociation constant. Okay, so definitely wake up now if you sort of went away because this was too technical, because now I want to tell you a few things uh, that you can do now that we have a method to calculate uh, the effective dissociation constant of a given protein with an RNA. And the first uh, story here is about protein-protein cooperativity. Now, uh, messenger RNAs, which is what we mostly think about here, uh, they, they are regulated by proteins, and that means that there are typically many proteins binding the same uh, messenger RNA. Uh, also, uh, these proteins regulate the messenger RNA, and regulation typically requires logic. Something's supposed to happen when this protein and this protein is present, or maybe when this protein is present and this protein absent. Logic, in biochemistry terms, means cooperativity. Right, that one binding event depends on the other binding event. And you can, of course, generate cooperativity by having the proteins interact with each other directly, but you can also have RNA structure provide such cooperativity. And here is how we think this could happen. If you have uh, this red and this green protein binding site in this particular structure, if the red protein binds, that has to break these base pairs here, and that makes it easier for the green protein to come in than if the red protein hadn't been there. And so here you see that just the part, the, the, the fact that both proteins bind the same RNA, it could generate cooperativity with them without them actually ever interacting uh, with each other directly. Now, given that we can now quantitatively predict these kind of things, we can figure out if that really happens or if this is sort of just um, a weird idea. Okay, so what we're actually doing 
uh, is we are quantitating cooperativity in the following way. If you have two proteins binding your RNA, you have this thermodynamic square here, where you either have the RNA unbound over here, you have it bound by both proteins down here. Up here, you have only the first one bound and down here, only the second one, right? So you can go from here by first binding the first and then the second, or you can first bind the second and then the first. Each of these transitions has a change in Gibbs free energy associated with it. Uh, and if there is no cooperativity, adding the first protein in the absence of the second protein, or adding the first protein in the presence of the second protein, if those two give you this, you don't have cooperativity. Uh, and so we are uh, looking at the difference between these two as a measure of the, uh, of the cooperativity in the system. Over here, we plot this measure as a function of distance between the protein binding sites. Uh, the blue line is the mean. That is very small, but that being small just means that there is equal amounts of positive and negative cooperativity. The green line is the standard deviation. That captures sort of the overall magnitude of this effect. And you see that this effect is, in fact, um, in, on the order of a kcal per mole, or more importantly, one or two kT, all the way out to about 55 or 30 nucleotides of distance. And so basically, when it's over k, uh, kT, uh, then we would consider this uh, being a, a significant uh, amount of cooperativity. So it's not just readily possible, uh, but you can actually see that that typically happens uh, if, you, uh, if you look at actual sequences. A second thing uh, is uh, signal nucleotide polymorphisms. Uh, those are inherited genetic differences in the genomic nucleotides. So that means differences between all of us uh, happen at about every thousand nucleotides or so in the genome. And they are most interesting when they are correlated with phenotypes or diseases. Now, how do they affect phenotypes? Well, if they're in the protein coding sequence, they change the protein, therefore they change the phenotype. But there are SNPs in untranslated regions. They can affect the phenotype by changing the interaction with regulatory proteins. Again, if the SNP is right in the protein binding site, then it's not a big surprise that it changes the uh, interaction with the protein, but it is also possible for a SNP that's outside of the binding site to affect the binding affinity through the RNA secondary structure because the SNP will change the structure and the structure will affect the affinity. And that effect is what we are quantifying here. Uh, so we choose random RNA sequences. This is very similar to the protein-protein cooperativity. Uh, we are looking at all possible uh, mutations of the middle site of our sequences. We vary the location of the protein binding site, and we again quantify the effect by looking at a delta delta G, which is the effect of the protein binding in the one allele of the SNP and the effect of the protein binding in the other allele of the SNP and taking that difference. The means are again zero, no surprise, it goes up and down more or less equally, but the standard deviations again are on the order of one kcal per mole, all the way out to, in this case, even 50, 60, 70 nucleotides away uh, from the SNP. Uh, so again, uh, we get a significant contribution here uh, to the protein binding affinity from SNPs that are about 50 or so nucleotides away from the protein binding site. Here we went even a little further. So the previous data was on random sequences. Uh, this is now uh, on, on actual human sequences. So you can get actual binding sites for a protein. This is the protein HUR. Uh, you can get actual SNPs from dbSNP in humans, and you can then look for pairs of them where a SNP is sort of in the vicinity of an HUR binding site. And since we have a tool that can calculate the binding affinity for any sequence, uh, we can use uh, the two sequences, the two alleles of that SNP, calculate their binding affinity and look at their ratio. That ratio is how much does the SNP change the binding of this protein. And these are histograms of these ratios. Now, the boring part is the most obvious one. That's that it peaks at one. That's not surprising. Most SNPs don't do anything. But the interesting part is that out here in the tails, there is actually still a good number of SNPs that have up to tenfold effects on the protein binding affinity. And what I'm not showing you here is uh, that these are not just the ones that are very close by, 
uh, even the ones that are very far out here uh, in terms of effect still are up to 50 nucleotides away from their protein binding site. Uh, so even in real sequences with real SNPs, it seems that some of these SNPs have a significant effect on the binding of the nearby protein. Now, does it matter for biology? Well, the way to see this is to look for selection. If uh, it doesn't matter for biology, then you would expect that the major allele, the SNP that you find more often in the human population, and the minor allele that you find less often have a 50-50 chance of making the protein binding stronger or weaker. And the data that I'm showing here is that a very significant, is a very significant overrepresentation with a p-value of 10 to the negative 28, such that the major allele, the one that you find more frequently in the population, is actually the one that binds stronger uh, to the protein. So clearly, there is actually a selective pressure here uh, that, uh, that, uh, that gives us this imbalance. Okay, so in the last few minutes here, uh, I'll quickly talk about double-stranded RNA binding proteins, which is sort of a most recent uh, progress on this. So everything I've told you so far were single-stranded binding proteins. They only bind to bases that are unpaired. So double-stranded binding proteins do exactly the opposite. They only buy, pair, bind to bases that are paired. Uh, now, this is technically a little bit more complicated because on a single strand that's bound, you have two ends coming out. On a double strand that's bound, you have four ends coming out. Uh, but we very recently uh, have been able to show uh, that this can still be done uh, in n to the third time uh, to basically uh, look at all cost configurations of proteins binding anywhere on the RNA uh, on any double-stranded piece. And interestingly, um, if we apply that to random sequences, uh, and uh, so our bare affinity is here, uh, 10 nanomolar, uh, what this is is a histogram of many random sequences and their effective uh, affinities. Uh, where again, the bare one is the red line. And you see that now we not only get effects of a factor 10, but we actually get effects for a few of these sequences of many orders of magnitude uh, due to the secondary structure uh, compared to what the, uh, what the protein would see if it bound just in one particular spot. Okay, so let me summarize. Um, I showed you that we are able to incorporate RNA protein binding uh, directly into secondary structure prediction, both for single-stranded and double-stranded uh, RNA binding proteins. I showed you that the interactions of long RNAs with proteins are quantitatively predicted. We can directly compare to experiment. And that then these inter this interplay between RNA structure and protein binding mediates both cooperativity of multiple proteins binding an RNA, as well as at a distance effects of SNPs on protein binding. Uh, we would like to, uh, in the future, look at uh, sequence dependent binding of multiple proteins. So what happens if you not have multiple copies of the same protein on an RNA, but if you have different proteins trying to bind the same RNA as that happens actually in nature. Uh, we haven't looked at cooperativity between single and double-stranded RNA binding proteins. Now that we have the techniques to do that, we can look for that, and we certainly would expect it's there. Uh, and uh, most importantly, everything I've told you about is in equilibrium. Uh, now these things don't fold infinitely fast, uh, so we would like to understand the uh, effects of RNA kinetics in the presence of proteins. Lastly, of course, I would like to acknowledge the people who have done the actual work. Uh, my, my trainees, Ilan Shadov, Yishan Lin, and Jeff Geither, uh, as well as uh, acknowledge the NSF uh, for funding this work over uh, a long time. Uh, lastly, before taking questions, I would like to uh, put a short plug in here that I am actually one of your two as associate editors for Physical Review E and Research, uh, and I have been involved in the QBio section of Archive since its inception. Uh, so whenever you uh, see me somewhere at a conference or you know want to have a chat with me, uh, I'd be happy to talk about these things as well. Uh, but at this point, of course, I'm happy to take questions about the talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Rob, for this very interesting talk. So um, there's a question from Robin uh, Brusma. 
Um, so RAP protein interactions often involve zinc fingers. Do you can you be can that be included in your uh, picture? All right, that's a great question. So, so we don't actually molecularly determine where the interactions are coming from. So our input are always these RNA compete experiments that tell us what the protein is doing on an individual short piece of RNA. So as long as that experiment has been done, we can incorporate that into our predictions and then say, what's the effect of structure, uh, secondary structure on this protein RNA interaction? But so we, we are not able to just take a protein without experimental data uh, and, and, and figure out what sort of the, the rules for binding it to one particular site are. What we can do is if we know the rules of binding to one particular site, then we can tell you in the context of a longer RNA, how, how will these rules change? So it's a, it's a bioinformatics approach. Am I correct? If you want, I mean, yes, I mean, it's a bioinformatics approach, but I mean, it certainly does use the statistical physics of, okay. uh, I mean, that, that it, it's a real partition function over all these structures, right? But, but we do not, yes, we do have to take as an input the, the actual rules for the interactions with one individual binding site. Uh, is, this, is this binding described completely by classical statistical mechanics or authorization have to be introduced at some point? Sorry, I didn't understand the, the, the or part. Uh, I just wondered whether uh, classical statistical mechanics is sufficient to evaluate the partition function or whether quantization must be introduced. Oh, quantization. Yeah, I, I, we don't believe that quantization does matter. Now, kinetics probably does matter. And I mean, that's something that we are looking into. Uh, but yeah, I don't think quantization does matter here. So I think uh, if we talk about quantization, the hydrogen, uh, hydrogen bond of the thing, right? They include it in the parameters, right? I can say this way. Um, Christian Rodin seems to left. So he asked a question, uh, she asked a question, uh, have you worked on helicases at all? That is a great question. And so yes, in the context of starting to look at RNA kinetics. Now for a helicase, you do have to do kinetics, right? I mean, a helicase actually moves along the RNA. So you you can't do that without kinetics. And we have started to look into helicases in our you know, attempts to describe kinetics, but that's maybe something for, you know, talk a few years down the road. Yeah, so when you talk about RNA kinetics, I'm really interested in this. So, um, so we are talking about uh, mRNA as well? Yeah, so we think mostly of mRNA here. And I mean, I know people always draw mRNA as sort of this long squiggly line, but I mean, an mRNA is not meant to have a particular secondary structure, but mm. it has nucleotides and nucleotides base pair. So it will have secondary structure. Now it, it may not have just one secondary structure and that's why it's important to calculate partition functions because there's a superposition of many, many secondary structures in this ensemble. Of course, any given RNA at any given point in time has only one of them. But so the way we think of it is that it sort of uh, goes through this ensemble of structures. Uh, but yes, yeah, so mRNA, we are definitely thinking of, of mRNAs here largely. 